Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. Yesterday I uh, read through a long read by Ivan Osnos in The New Yorker, um, The Future of America's Contest with China, and added in a lot of my uh, uh, thoughts at the end, coming from articles that I had written over, that, over the last three years and uh, put it all together. His article is absolutely brilliant um, and well worth uh, reading yourself. But uh, I put, put together the key points uh, in a short video uh, if you're interested. Macro thoughts. Rabobank sees the Federal Reserve cutting, to rates, cutting rates to zero before the end of 2020, and I'm inclined to agree now, in point of fact. So we had a huge event uh, overnight, um, and I'll get to it, but basically Brent Oil briefly spiked to almost $72, before dropping down to about $69 as investors, investors digested Iran's retaliation for the Soleimani attack. This chart is from J.S. Blockland. Yesterday, before um, this event, uh, the marketeer also put out a tweet, oil buy or sell, or is this just a huge range? Pushing momentum breakouts in oil has been wrong since 2019. And I'm inclined to agree. Um, I expect oil to come off now, um, uh, and I'll explain to you why. Um, Bernanke, of course, has previously said that uh, gold, people hold gold as protection against what we call tail risks, really, really bad outcomes. Um, and certainly there's a fin de siècle, even apocalyptic mood afoot. The conundrum, as I wrote last year, for those who wish to bet on the end of the world, is this, however, what would be the point the world would have ended? Gold surged to $1,600 an ounce uh, for the first time since 2013. Uh, you see this spike. Uh, this is Tracy Alloway. Uh, we're currently at 15 and 90 and I think that looks toppy as well. Um, uh, and just a, another point from Daniel Lacal, the biggest nightmare for markets in 2020 is if inflation rises, there will be billions in real losses in sovereign bond portfolios. You know, I've been expecting these bonds to sell off at some point, but each time you think everything is in place for a sell-off, something happens. But essentially, you know, notwithstanding these phenomenal dosages of free money, at some point it's going to be a Hotel California moment. Home thoughts, I never knew of a morning in Africa when I woke up and was not happy. That's a quote by Ernest Hemingway that Nishat used. This is a photograph of sunrise at Mahali, Missouri, where we visited for two nights. They've got a very attractive residence rate. And really, it was very beautiful, delicious food, great hospitality. And they're, on, um, the, uh, they're in the Conservancy, which I prefer, frankly, to the Mara, because uh, in the Conservancy, there are fewer people. What you see, you know, you don't get surrounded by hundreds of cars. And we saw elephants, we saw pride of lions, two fantastic males lionesses and their cubs and so much more. Really thoroughly enjoyed ourselves. And a big thank you to Newton who took us around and was quite a character. Reality is not always probable or likely, pronounced Jorge Louis Borges. Okay, let's get to the main event. Uh, I'll start with the tweet I saw from BBC World Service. Will the Iranian missile attack draw a line under the latest escalation in US-Iranian relations? And this is a point I was making in my article, The Assassination. Until now, it's been very finely calibrated and linear. And again, this is linear and trying to avoid a non-linear um, phase. 
And I think it's essentially uh, presenting Mr. Trump uh, with the question, your move, President Trump. And Trump has two options to ramp it up and then we're into a non-linear phase or to ramp it down. And going by his tweet, uh, which he issued this morning, um, I think he might take the off-ramp, which is what I think most of us would recommend him to do. Iran state media footage shows the missiles targeting Iraq's Ain al-Assad air base, which hosts US troops in response to Soleimani's assassination. That is from Global Times. Jabad Zarif, Iran took and concluded, concluded being the uh, key word, proportionate measures, proportionate again, the calibration about which I'm speaking, in self-defense under Article 51 of the UN Charter, targeting base from which cowardly armed attack against our citizens and senior officials were launched. We do not seek escalation or war, but will defend ourselves against any aggression. So there too you're seeing they're sort of putting the ball in Trump's court and saying we've taken a response. They had to, right? I mean, it would have been a, a regime, internal regime change moment had they not responded. While we await Trump's statement, there are two ways this could go, ramp up or ramp down. And uh, that's the point. U.S. officials says that the Pentagon will begin sending six B-52 bombers to Diego Garcia. This was announced yesterday. The planes will be available for operations against Iran if ordered, the official reportedly added. Sputnik Moscow sends missile ship Marshal Ustinov to Syria amid fears of confrontation between Washington and Iran. Russian President Putin arrived in Damascus on Tuesday and met with Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. I wrote about this in my article, The Assassination, The Escalation of Shadow War, and I'll just take a few points again. Um, the crisis group Robert Malley said whether Trump intended it or not, it is for all practical purposes a declaration of war. Um, uh, David Duke, of all people, the truth is that Soleimani, along with Christian Russia and the courageous Syrian people, kept three and a half million Christians in Syria from being slaughtered by ISIS and Al-Qaeda. It was interesting that in the photographs I saw of Bashar and Putin, they actually visited a Christian church in Damascus. Suleimani was an iconic figure known as the commander of hearts and Suleiman the Magnificent. Um, he led the fight against Saddam. Um, he belonged to a small fraternity formed during the sacred defense the name given to the Iran-Iraq war, which lasted from 1980 to 1988. A lot of folks who comment on Iranian bad behavior fail to have any understanding of the history of Iran. Just start with Kapuczynski, the Shah of Shahs, go back to Mossadegh, and then look at that video uh, of uh, Khamenei praying. The intensity of the Iranians is, is something that I think people fail to understand, where martyrdom is seen as a paradise. Um, and this is what uh, Suleimani said, one type of paradise that many imagine is about streams, beautiful maidens, and lush landscape, but there is another kind of paradise, the battlefield. The front, he said, was the lost paradise of the human beings. The battlefield is mankind's lost paradise, the paradise in which morality and human conduct are at their highest. And if you go back into Shi'ism, you know, the martyrdom of the Prophet's grandsons is something that also resonates very powerfully and probably it's simply not understandable 
to people who are living in this day and age and in a different environment. Um, uh, so the question is, where do we go from here? I think um, I'm expecting now a ratcheting down and I'm expecting Trump to take the off-ramp. Of course, it's very binary. If he doesn't, then seriously all bets are off and we're in that Archduke Franz Ferdinand moment I concluded with in my article. The market ear, two birds with one bomb. Have a look at this, which is the whole wag the dog theory. Imam Khamenei leading the funeral prayer for General Soleimani and General al muhandis And uh, I suggest you watch that if you really want to understand the intensity about which I was speaking. It's extremely powerful, really is. If Iran doesn't develop nuclear weapons now as a deterrent, its leaders aren't rational. According to basic Western deterrence theory, this is Mark Curtis, and he, this is the point which I wrote about previously, and why Kim, for example, is going to watch this and say to himself, I would be insane to give up my nuclear deterrent. Now, Zero Hedge uh, uh, has Pablo, has Pepe Escobar writing that Baghdad was officially mediating between Tehran and Riyadh at the behest of Trump, and Soleimani was a messenger. And Pompeo, in a press conference yesterday, denied this, but essentially, I think Pompeo led Soleimani to the slaughter. Um, the bombshell facts were delivered by caretaker Iraqi Prime Minister Adil Abdul Mahdi during an extraordinary historic parliamentary session in Baghdad. Major General Qasem Soleimani had flown into Baghdad on a normal carrier flight carrying a diplomatic passport. He had been sent by Tehran to deliver in person a reply to a message from Riyadh on de-escalation across the Middle East. Those negotiations had been requested by the Trump administration. Adil Abdul Mahdi was supposed to meet Soleimani at 8.30 a.m. Baghdad time last Friday, but a few hours before the appointed time, Soleimani died as the object of a targeted assassination at Baghdad airport. Now, the fact is that the United States government on foreign soil as a guest nation has assassinated a diplomatic envoy who was on an official mission that had been requested by the United States government itself. Under these circumstances, it's no wonder the Iraqi parliament approved a non-binding resolution asking the Iraqi government to expel foreign troops by cancelling a request for military assistance from the US. Predictably, Yankee will refuse the demand. Trump, if they do ask us to leave, if we don't do it in a friendly basis, we will charge them sanctions like they've never seen before. It'll make Iranian sanctions look somewhat tame. So the decision to assassinate Soleimani in public, as Nasrallah reads it, was a psyop. And the fair retribution is ending the American military presence in our region. On myriad levels, Soleimani could be described as the 21st century Persian Che Guevara. The Americans have made sure he's metacizing into the Muslim resistance Che. No tsunami of pedestrian U.S. mainstream media PR will be able to disguise a massive strategic blunder, not to mention yet another blatantly illegal targeted assassination. <coughs> yet this might as well have been a purposeful blunder. Killing Suleimani does prove that Trump, the deep state and the usual suspects all agree on the essentials there can be no entente cordiale between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Divide and rule remains the norm. For all the rumble surrounding Iraqi commitment to expel US troops and the Iranian pledge to react to the Soleimani assassination, 
at a time of its choosing, there's no way to make the imperial masters listen without a financial hit. And here, Pepe gets quite interesting. Enter the world derivatives market, which every major player knows is a financial WMD. The derivatives are used to drain a trillion dollars a year out of the market and manipulated profits. These profits, of course, are protected under the too-big-to-prosecute doctrine. It's obviously parasitic and illegal. The beauty is that it can be turned into a nuclear option against the imperial masters. He's written extensively about it, New York Connections told me the columns all landed on Trump's desk. Obviously, he does not read anything, but the message was there and also delivered in person. Uh, if Tehran ever decided to shut down the Strait of Hormuz, call it the nuclear option, that would trigger a world depression as trillions of dollars of derivatives imploded. The BIS counts about $600 billion in total derivatives. Not really. Swiss sources say there are at least $1.2 quadrillion, with some placing it at $2.5 quadrillion. That would imply a derivatives market 28 times the world's GDP. On Hormuz, the shortage of 22% of the world oil supply simply could not be papered over it would detonate a collapse and cause a market crash infinitely worse than 1933 Weimar Germany. The Pentagon has gained every possible scenario of a war in Iran and the results are grim. Sound generals, yes there are some, know the US Navy would not be able to keep the Strait of Hormuz open. It would have to leave immediately or as sitting ducks face total annihilation. So, Trump threatening to destroy 52 Iranian sites, including priceless cultural heritage, is a bluff. Worse, this is the stuff of bragging by an ISIS-worthy barbarian. The Taliban destroyed the Bamiyan Buddhas. ISIS nearly destroyed Palmyra. Trump backer Almara Lego wants to join in as the destroyer of Persian culture. <coughs> the U.S. has issued, to wit about the Strait of Hormuz, a warning to ships across Middle Eastern waterways. Uh, Man Integrated looked into a possible blockade of the crowded Strait of Hormuz. He's a great resource that I follow. Um, so, we've got a highly volatile situation, but essentially I think we're going to have a ramp off. Trump, as I wrote on the 25th of November and previously, has been a big proponent of coercive financial currency and sanction warfare. And his policy of maximum pressure on Iran is that policy's apogee. And I think they were calculating that they'd put Iran under so much pressure that they were on the ropes in a Muhammad Ali moment, um, rope of dope, and, uh, and that the decapitation of Soleimani would tip it over the edge, but clearly that's not going to happen right now. Iran's currency markets are laid back. According to Charlie Robertson, the currency has only moved 4% weaker and was much weaker than this in 2018. Then, on top of that, we've had this uh, Ukra Ukrainian passenger aeroplane that crashed just outside of Tehran International Airport. Um, comparativist, I'm saying that there was likely a catastrophic explosion in the air at 7,000 feet, causing the fire we see before it crashes. And that took me back to Revelation. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. To wit, largest plague of locusts in a quarter century hits Africa and the Middle East. And there certainly is a fin de siècle, even apocalyptic mood of foot. When I was writing that article, I was referencing Greta Thunberg's points 
Um, and I learned that in the last 44 years we have achieved what we haven't. In all this while, a mass annihilation of our fellow earthlings. Between 1970 and 2014, Earth lost nearly 60% of its mammals, birds, fish, reptiles and amphibians, almost all of it due to human activity. Um, and to wit, you cannot make this up, a rocket attack, a plane crash, an earthquake near the nuclear reactor, um, 4.9 magnitude earthquake struck near Iran's Boucher nuclear power plant. The depth and epicenter indicate it was a natural event. Um, and then further to uh, this point, the number of animals feared dead in Australia's wildfires soars to over a billion. It's just incredible. Um, it's frightening. Uh, and that took me to my article, The End is Nigh. Fires are more frequent, more damaging, more terrifying. A symptom of the new age that I call the Pyrocene is an article in The Guardian. The worst fires have acquired names and become historical milestones, such as Red Tuesday, Ash Wednesday, Black Christmas, Black Saturday. Of course, in July of 64 AD, a great fire ravaged Rome for six days, destroying 70% of the city and leaving half its population homeless. Rome's emperor at the time, the decadent Nero, fiddled while Rome burned. Jeet Thayil said, the world is on fire, time is a bomb, 10,000 years are not enough when so much remains to be done. This is a gut-wrenching scene from the New South Wales of dead animals along the roadside. The bushfires are a climate change fueled ecological disaster. We should not look away, just look at that. The feedback loop and the risks of dieback where we enter a phase of cascading system collapse. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We're in the beginning of a mass extinction. The New Yorker has a super article on Jared Kushner. Um, one month after Trump's surprise win in the presidential election, Kushner met with Sergei Gorkov, the head of VEB Bank. Kushner in later congressional testimony said that his goals in the meeting were purely diplomatic. The Russian ambassador to the US had told him that Gorkov had a direct line to the Russian president who would give insight into how Putin was viewing the new administration and the best ways to work together. That month, Putin arranged an all-hands oligarch meeting. As one of the oligarchs in attendance, Petra Abin described it to the special counsel Robert Mueller's investigators to discuss US-Russia relations. At least three of Russia's most prominent oligarchs subsequently tried to solidify ties with a man who seemed their perfect counterpart, a young American oligarch whose family had grown wealthy with a healthy assist from government programs, the president-elect son-in-law Jared Kushner. Through the Russian ambassador's persistence, Gorkov got the meeting. According to Kushner, the two discussed US-Russia relations. Business was not on the agenda, but a VEB spokesperson told the Washington Post something altogether different. As described by the Post, the bank maintained that the session was held as part of a new business strategy and was conducted with Kushner in his role as the head of his family's real estate business. As most Americans struggle to discern what a Trump presidency would bring, the Russians accurately predicted that Kushner would be an immensely powerful figure in the incoming administration and that talking business could be a route to political influence. Kushner stated in an interview that he did not engage in any preparation for the meeting and that no one on the transition team even did a Google search for Gorkov's name. But Gorkov had prepared, he carried with him two gifts that showed he'd conducted a careful and deliberate investigation into the young man he was meeting. As Kushner explained in July 2017, one was a piece of art from Novogrudok, the village where my grandparents were from in Belarus. 
and the other was a bag of dirt from that same village. And the, the resonance of that bag of dirt is described in this article. Um, in, in order to see, and then talks about how his family came from Belarus to the US. Uh, Joe began as a carpenter in New Jersey. Carpenters were in high demand in the post-war years. In New Jersey, a thousand homes were built a week for a thousand straight weeks. <coughs> Soldiers returning from the war and their newly growing families needed homes. Builders received a huge boost from U.S. government programs. At the time of his death, in 1985, Joe had built 4,000 homes. The Kushners were part of a wealthy, aggressive and fiercely private coterie of developers in New Jersey known as the Holocaust Builders. Every year for Passover, Ray took the whole family to the Fontainebleau Hotel in Miami Beach, a high-rise high -rise arc of white concrete surrounded by myriad pools and decks and palm trees. She would pay for the whole family. She would rent a row of adjacent rooms. The cousins, Ray had more than a dozen grandchildren, would run from room to room, bouncing on beds and hanging out on balconies, clutching the $20 bills that Ray gave each of them for the arcade describing uh, uh, Kushner's uh, bar mitzvah. A central part of the bar mitzvah ceremony is the reading of a story from the Torah, Jared read Beshalak, the part of the Exodus story in which God parts the Red Sea for the Israelites and then allows the waters to flood the pursuing Egyptian army. Then talking about his father um, uh, and a civil lawsuit that the father and his brother um, uh, got involved in. Um, Charlie called Jimmy O'Toole, an East Orange police captain on the verge of retirement, who was also Charlie's running buddy, and offered him a lucrative gig. Um, Charlie passed O'Toole an accordion file stuffed with $20,000 in cash and asked him to hire a prostitute to seduce and entrap Esther's husband, Billy Shoulder. For months the scheme stalled. O'Toole, raised as an altar boy, was consumed by guilt. One day O'Toole took the file of cash back to Charlie's office, but Charlie wouldn't take no for an answer. Um, I want you to call this number and say you're a friend of John's, Charlie told him. It was a phone number for a Manhattan prostitute named Susanna, a high-priced European-born call girl on Manhattan's Upper East Side as Christie described her in his book, Let Me Finish. Um, copies of the video print eight and a half by 11 inch still photographs with the woman's face pixelated out. For months, Charlie did nothing. In March, Ray passed away. In May, Christie began sending out target letters, a sign that the investigation was intensifying. Two days after they were received, Charlie called O'Toole and asked him to have Tommy send the video and the stills to Esther. On the eve of her son Jacob's engagement party, Jacob had been born just a week after Jared and the two boys had grown up like brothers. Charlie wanted to send the package to ja ja Jacob too and to Jacob's two sisters. Jimmy O'Toole talked him out of it. Then Esther receives uh, the video when people under investigation decide to take the law into their own hands to obstruct justice, to attempt to impede the rule of law, Christie said, it is our obligation to act swiftly and surely to end the obstruction. Charlie tried to destroy my father, Jared said, later said, as described by Christie. There was a dispute inside the family, Christie quotes Jared as saying. My father made those people rich and they did nothing. They just benefited from my father's hard work. And those are the people who turned him in. It wasn't fair. Um, he then buys a newspaper, The Observer. Jared pushed him to assign a story that would be a hit job on Chris Christie, whose star had risen since he sent Jared's father to jail. Kaplan refused. Jared denied targeting Christie, but former employees recalled him boasting about upcoming hit jobs in the paper. According to former Kushner employees, when the paper published one of these hit jobs, Kushner would point to the story as if to suggest this could be you. 
then Kushner companies um, saying and saying about him Jared was lovely until he was not until you had a falling out and were dead to him and he was out to get you then describing Trump we don't have victories anymore we're stupid um, Jared saw himself as a disruptor people who worked with him told me um, then uh, saying that uh, Jared found success by taking what others saw as impossible foolhardy risks, becoming in his mid-twenties the publisher of a weekly newspaper in an era when newspapers were cratering, purchasing 66 Fifth Avenue on the eve of the Great Recession. The building had nearly failed when the Kushners managed barely to refinance it. The lesson he took from this, according to someone familiar with the deal, was not, holy shit, I almost lost everything. It was, I should take on as much risk as I can. Um, then Jared attended a now infamous meeting at Trump Tower with Donald Trump Jr., Paul Manafort, and Ent Mysteries of a Russian oligarch that Trumps had once worked with to discuss some official documents and information that would incriminate Hillary and her dealings with Russia. Uh, no one seemed to question the seamless pivot from business to politics to discussing Russia and its government support for Mr. Trump and dirt on Hillary Clinton, which by this time the Russian government did indeed have. Truth has been replaced by a new currency, dirt. That is what Trump was seeking in Ukraine. That is what Russia was offering in 2016. Great article. I tweeted once, Jared Kushner, um, in July 2017 is the broker of our times, the Adnan Khashoggi at the court of King Donald the Trumpeter. Let's go on to currency markets, Euro dollar 111.44, dollar index 96.914, Japanese yen 108.43, Swiss franc 0.9701, the pound 131.40, the Australian dollar 0.6875, uh, India rupee 72, South Korean 111.70, Brazilian real 406.78, Egyptian pound 16.05 and the Rand 14.32.65. Dollar index <coughs> 96.92, <Euro> dollar <coughs> I still think it's going higher. I think it'll end the year at 120. Tesla at 82 billion dollars is now the most valuable automaker ever eclipsing Ford's 1999 high water mark. In 1999, Ford sold 4 million cars and trucks. In 2019, Tesla sold 367,500. Sub-Saharan Africa, after 34 years of NRM M7 Hunter, this is what our people have been reduced to, kneeling before Sabagabe, King of Kings, in a line to get a small handout in a Brian envelope, Kiza Bezige. Africa's dinosaurs are dying out, says Alex Vines in the Mail and Guardian. Africa's dinosaur leaders are members of an increasingly small and unstable club. Popular protests last year forced Algeria's President Bouteflika out of office after almost 20 years in power as well as Sudan's President Omar al-Bashir, who has ruled for 30 years. In 2017, Mugabe was deposed in a military coup after 40 years. In 2011, mass protests led to the downfall of Zine Abedin Ben Ali after he had been in power for 23 years. Somewhat smoother are the political transitions in Angola, the DR Congo, Jose Eduardo dos Santos, after almost 38 years in power, stepped down from office in 2017 as his term ended. So did his younger neighbor, Joseph Kabila, in January 2019, after 18 years in the presidency. What the six former leaders had in common was that they wanted to remain heads of state and considered succession planning or stepping down only as a last resort. This year will be crucial for the six countries in political transition, particularly as the reform window period is short. So from A to Z, he talks about Algeria, Angola, DR Congo, um, 
Zim Tunisia, Zimbabwe, uh, looks bleak, a far cry from the euphoria of two years ago when a military-assisted transition removed Mugabe, replaced him with Emerson Manangagwa. Long-standing leaders have been persistent in Africa despite the end of single-party rule in favor of a multi-party system. Uh, talking about Guinea's Teodoro Obiang, who's been in power for 40 years. Museveni, 33 years. Will there be any more departures from the Dinosaurs Club in 2020? He's talking about Kurun Zinzo, who said he won't stand for the 2020 elections in Burundi. Togo's foray, Ganasigbe, 14 years in power. Sassoon Gueso, 25 years. Ali Bongo. What the political transitions have in common is that honeymoons are short and that whether they are led by the interim administrations or elected leaders, they need to deliver political and socio-economic improvements to succeed, but have inherited shambolic economies. Their success depends on accountable political leadership and domestic and international support. 9th of December, I said it's time to big up the dosage of quaaludes because I'm seeing a massive debt crisis unfold. I think we've borrowed billions and misspent it. Uh, 14th of October, I was quoting Ecclesiastes, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. It seems to me, I said, we're at a pivot moment and we can keep regurgitating the same old mantras like a stuck record. And if we do that, this turns Ozymandias. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Nothing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretch far away. 9th of September, on the occasion of Mugabe's funeral, I said fighting for independence is not the same as building an economy which provides opportunity for all its citizens. 29th of July, I wrote about the Ooh, the Spring, in Khartoum. I said the zeitgeist of the revolution in Khartoum was intoxicating. As I watched events unfold, it felt like Sudan was a portal into a whole new normal. Pompeo, Secretary Pompeo, I've upgraded Sudan to our special watch list as a result. I must commend him on that and also commend Secretary Pompeo on dumping MEK and Mariam Rajavi. Glad to see that Christians in Sudan are able to freely celebrate Orthodox Christmas today. This progress is possible because of steps the civilian-led transitional government has taken to advance religious freedom. I've upgraded Sudan to our special watch list as a result. Hugh Masakela, I want to be there when the people start to turn it around. 11th of February. I was asking about Africa and the vision thing. Who's providing it? It's high time we authored it because this is a born free generation. I was quoting Harold Macmillan from 1960. The wind of change is blowing through this continent. Whether we like it or not, this growth of national consciousness is a political fact. More than 6,000 people apparently are dead in DR Congo due to the worst measles outbreak in recent history but this is barely making global headlines. Ethiopia returns to double-digit economic growth. Forecast economic growth will accelerate to 10.8% for the fiscal year ending in July. Um, economic reforms by Abbey's government have renewed interest from investors, attracted billions of dollars in financial support from lenders such as the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. However, Ethiopia's current account deficit narrowed to $4.5 billion. Uh, but look at this, exports are just $2.77 billion compared to $15.1 billion of imports. Ethiopia rising was something I wrote after Abiy had been in power for 90 days. And I said then, the Prime Minister needs to execute real quick on the economic front. But if he levels the playing field, a whole troop of folks will be looking to pile in. 
um, uh, Orange picks BNP Paribas and Morgan Stanley to advise on an Africa IPO. The Middle East and Africa business reported $1.8 billion of adjusted earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation and amortization. About 20 countries across Africa and the Middle East. South African all share up 0.53%, dollar rand 14.326, Egypt pound 16 uh, 0415, EGX 30 is down 5.36% so far this year. When Nigeria rebased its GDP, adding in things like the music industry and Nollywood, Nigeria's output leapt from $270 billion to $510 billion, Africa report. Um, uh, then saying it's connecting Africa to the world and connecting the world to Africa indeed. Internet is upending business model after business model. The streaming generation, musicians and industry players are trying to keep up. Um, uh, Bijar Day recently told Rolling Stone in the West, I can make gambles and book venues by myself because I have data about my listeners. I know that in New York I have about 500,000 listeners a month. So I know I can have 1,000 people at my concert. I know 30% are from Brooklyn, so I can do a show near where they live. I don't have that data back home. Nigeria has 36 states. I've not even toured 10, and that's partly because my fans are consuming the music in an alternate way that is not trackable. The youths listen to those artists more than they listen to governments, so I have to be responsible if I have the number one female and number one male artist, that is real influence. Nigerian all shares up 2.77% year to date. Ghana Stock Exchange is up 1.15% year to date. US is bolstering Kenya based security after Americans killed in attack, deployed additional forces to Kenya on Monday to bolster security at a key airfield after an attack by Al Shabaab militants. That's US Africa Command. In Lamu County, the coastal region of Kenya, some civilians are moving out of their homes into small towns for safety. Moving out of villages near the Manda Bay airfield for fear of further attacks or getting caught up in clashes. People are in fear and people have been moving out of the village to the nearby town, that's Hindi and Mokowe. We have villages like Mokondoni, we have Sinambio, Kosara, so people are in fear. That's why they're going to town, but the security is very tight. Our military are doing a good job. That's Anab Haji, a member of the County Assembly of Lamu. If people can attack such a military camp for a powerful country, what about ordinary people like us who just walk with nothing? Chinese firm constructing new Lamu port suspends work over insecurity, dismisses over 2,000 employees, predictably. I wrote about the Lamu port in an article, The Indian Ocean economy in a port race. For every thousand shillings you generate in daily sales, irrespective of whether you're selling at a profit or a loss, you'll have to set aside 30 shillings to give to the KRA at the end of the month. Nairobi all shares up 0.14%. I saw this tweet from Mokaya. Let's take the case of DTB. They gave Nakumat 3.65 billion shillings. A single client was given these colossal amounts without security basically free money given with no hurdles because Napomat was a big brand. That's Diamond Trust, whose market cap is $304 million and trades on a very low price earnings ratio of 4.6, largely in part because the market does not think these losses have been fully provisioned. Creditors of Kenyan supermarket Nakamat vote to wind it up with the administration process here in Kenya you spend more money throwing good money after bad, said one creditor. NSE 20 is up 0.65%. Um, and then uh, Fundi Mungai, I hate to have to note this, but Nakamat might as well be the undoing of the Kenya commercial paper market, where people were, I remember being at dinner once somewhere, and everyone had invested in this paper for 24%. And I, Turn around and I said, well, if they're paying you 24%, you're never going to get it back. And my wife kicked me under the table. With that, I take her leave. <laughs>